Welcome to the Before Azeroth series, a series where I cover MMORPGs, MORPGs, MUDs, and other virtual world and massively multiplayer titles from before the release of World of Warcraft, specifically choosing titles that I have very little or no experience playing. I was a long time Azeroth's call player. I played a fair amount of Ultima Online, played a lot of the forthcoming, and I was a huge fan of the first PC game I ever played, which was Legend of the Red Dragon, the original. Never played Legend of the Red Dragon 2, didn't see a need to, much like I didn't see a need to play Azeroth's Call 2. So let's get to the game. I'll go ahead and show some game footage as we discuss this. So Legend of the Red Dragon, the original, was created by Seth Abel Robinson of Robinson's Technology. He's a game developer from Japan, and he started off wanting to produce a door game, BBS door game, for his Amiga. And that inspired Legend of the Red Dragon, the original game, which was released in 1989. It was an F to attract new users to his Amiga BBS. He was only 14 years old at the time. So keep that in mind as we discuss the lore, story, gameplay mechanics, and other specifics of this title. There's definitely an adolescent tone. And you can see a lot of 90s. Let's be shocking for shocking sake style of culture peering through. So Legend of the Red Dragon 2, the less successful sequel that's often still played by a few, but it's often the forgotten sequel, much like in a lot of ways Azeron's Call 2 was. So was the sequel, well, Legend of the Red Dragon 2, is released in 1991. It's an overhead top-down sort of action RPG with ANSI graphics and turn-based combat. It includes a map editor, and it's very easy to modify and add new content with the scripting, custom, create custom content with the scripting engine. We're gonna be focusing on the base game, not all of the various add-ons and whatnot that you can get for the game. Being familiar with the original game would help, but is not necessary. I'll try to cover the various characters, plot points, etc. in enough detail where it won't be necessary. So yeah, the original Legend of the Red Dragon is one of a short list of multiplayer games that inspired my interest in multiplayer gaming in the first place. It was the first game on, that I played on the first PC I ever owned which is a 386 SX, played 25 megahertz machine, had a 40 meg hard drive, four megs of RAM, and no CD drive. It did have a three and a five inch floppy drive though, and it served its previous life as a BBS. So yeah, I had that BRE, I had two different versions of Usurper, there's a game called Bordello that was locked out to me and I actually taught myself how to use some of the basics of MS-DOS to bypass that lock because I was told that I shouldn't be playing it at my age, which was eight. But yeah, the first three Quake games, Azeron's Call and Legend of the Red Dragon, are the only three games I can think of that are multiplayer PC games that I've played on a relatively consistent basis for over two decades. Now I do visit, I do revisit the Super Mario games quite a bit and some other console games, but as far as PC games go, that's it. But yeah, it's a bit of a Legend of the Red Dragon 1 snob, much like as an original Azeron's Call snob, and I actively avoided the sequels, especially seeing that both games we're quite different looking. Uh, 
So there's a when you're playing this game, there's a lot of content here that is not suitable for children. And I'll try to give a warning when that content's about to be discussed. So the lore in this story, various plot arcs are relatively basic. There are rumors of the return of the red dragon from the first game. There's a dragon tooth clan and some other groups that are out there seemingly either trying to help protect against the red dragon, profit off the fear of the red dragon returning, or a little of both possibly. You have Barrack, who was the level two master from the original game. He's taken over the training center and the former top master has been banished from the town. There are many cultists and militant groups that roam the land. Rape, robbery, thievery, and other debauchery run rampant outside the cities. And there's even quite a few corrupt cities, which we'll go into. It's definitely a corrupt land of morally objectionable behaviors being permitted or ignored. And you start off as a nobody that lives with your mother and are left to your own devices. You can become a hero, a villain, or whatever else you desire within the confines of a quite, quite dated game engine. You're probably going to be telnetting in to play this game if you're playing a multiplayer. So, no sound, no music. Not sure if there's PC speaker sounds from the actual DOS version if you want to play that locally. Much is left to your imagination in this game, and or it's explained in plain text. There's an occasional ASCII art picture that comes up. But yeah, your character is a character, as in a character from the character set. As far as the gameplay goes, I believe it's aged quite a bit better than a lot of early 3D titles have by comparison. It's quite simple. It's easy to understand what you need to do once you get going. You explore, you have random encounters. You can usually tell by hit points or just by trial and error which enemies you can fight. It, when you go to upgrade your weapon, it's clear which weapons are more powerful. And the stats, there's really not a whole lot of stats to keep track of. Something else to note if you're wanting to play this game that might turn you off to it is that this is a game with PK mechanics. As in player killer. And this includes offline PK. So if you're not in a designated area, such as an inn, and you log off, your character is still sitting there. And a player can come along, attack you, and hopefully you're adequately geared. Because if not, well, you'll end up logging back in, missing a lot of gold as well as experience. And yes, you do lose half your gold and quite significant amount of experience when you die. Imagine playing on a World of Warcraft PvP server where when you log off, your character doesn't go with you. Your character just sits there and waits for somebody to come along. And then the computer decides to engage in the fight for you if you're attacked. Which who knows, maybe for somebody that's especially lousy at the game, maybe that's better. But yeah, that's a big turnoff. You can play this locally in DOSBox. You don't have to play it multiplayer. And given that the community is pretty sparse, you're not going to find very many BBS servers to turn on into that have a huge population of active players. I came across V-E-R-T dot Synchro, that's S-Y-N 
chro.net. It has an active admin and a few players on there. It looks like there's maybe at most five active players counting me. Some of the, it is by default a turn limited game, which is a relic from the BBS days. So you get you can move so many spaces in the day. Luckily on this server it's unlimited, which is quite the benefit of somebody trying to run the game for the purpose of creating content. So yeah, there is a clean mode to the game which removes the adult content. Adult content includes being able to buy prostitutes, heirs saving somebody from being raped, and quite a bit of other stuff within the game that's not it's of sexual it's sexual content that wouldn't be appropriate for a young kid. So what what's the point of this game? Besides running around like a fool and fighting stuff like I am in the video. Well, the main objectives are there's basically two main paths. You can be go on the good path where you need a plus 100 alignment and all four parts of the sky staff collected. Evil requires one negative 100 alignment and 100 quest points. You get alignment points for how you interact in different situations. For example, one of the earliest things you can do south of one of the first towns is you find a little girl. You can sell her to the pawn shop for money, where there's no change in alignment. You can take her to the Red Dragon Inn in Green Town, get some gold and quest points. Or you can, well, you can actually kill her for negative alignment. It's also a different place where you can, in another town, you can save somebody from getting robbed. You can save lady from getting raped. Quite a bit of opportunities to get your alignment up. The Sky Staff you find through random encounters with a hooded figure. And oh yeah, if you look at the map, you don't actually see the enemies on there, so you don't know what's going to be one space over, other than just the stuff, set objects where you, like the mountains and Places you can't walk to. So yeah, that's that's the basic goals of the game. But the way a lot, the way I've noticed a lot of people play the Legend of the Red Dragon games is just to try to get to the top of the player list, be the top dog on the server. So yeah, early quests and some of the early characters. The very first quest you'll do, or have the option of doing, is collecting ingredients for your mother to make pie, which includes collecting raspberries and collecting milk. Just to help you get started if you decide to play this game, spoiler warning here. You walk outside the house on the first screen. Go to the center right of the screen. The far right, the center of the far right. And there's a raspberry bush right there. And then you go one screen west, one screen north into town at the shop. You can buy milk. You can also find some coins on the table inside your mother's house. If you talk to your mother, you realize that your character is quite rude. Uh, delinquent, the mother says, despite her being quite polite to you. You're quite rude. And you'll notice your player character is quite rude in a lot of encounters. So if you're the type of role player that doesn't want to play a complete douchebag, then just kind of skip over some of the text and read what you want into your what your character says. 
because there really is a lot of options as far as what the way you can answer and handle situations. In reality, you could skip what your character is actually saying and in your head just say whatever you would want your character to say. The berries can be used as a weapon. Plus, it has plus one attack bonus, which is the weakest in the game. And the first time you get a rusty dagger, which is plus two. Really, you want to try to get the short sword as soon as possible, or at least a normal dagger. If you go two screens south of Stonebrook, which is the first town, there's a cabin where you can get a heavy coat from a room, and that's where Turgon's at. And that's one of the main quests of the game, is clearing Turgon's name. Which, Beric, through some questionable... It's not really stated what his exact motives were explicitly. But he did... Did help disseminate false information to get Turgon banished. There's also an old hag south of south of Stonebrook who is looking for Hector. Now if you give her a couple of ingredients, I believe it's egg and milk, she'll give you a brew that gives you five extra hit points. She'll go send you to find Hector. And Hector is a parrot that used to be a kid that threw rocks at the old hag's house. And the old hag, being a witch, turned the boy into a parrot and was fattening the parrot up to eat him. So the parrot ran away. It's another chance to change your alignment. You can free the bird, or you can return the bird. Also in the general area, I don't want to spoil it, there's a tree house. If you come across a bird, and ask if you want to throw a rock at it in the early part of the game. You want to do that. And then if you hit the bird and you're given a quote, write that quote down exactly. Because once you find the treehouse, you'll need that as a password. And that will act as a safe haven for when you're lower level. And a few screens over from your starting place, you'll run into... We'll run into Neb. It's along Neb's road. He's a bully that blocks the road. He has 25 hit points. You want to you wanna gear up enough to get rid of him as soon as possible. Because once you get rid of him, you won't have to worry about paying the toll. There's lots of places in the game like that. Where it'll ask for a pass. Or you'll have somebody blocking the way. You typically only have to defend the handle the situation once, and then it's resolved for good. But I don't want to spoil any of the, the rest of the details of the game. But I will discuss some of the different towns in the game. And let me get that pulled up really quick. Had some notes on it. Once you get through all the basic quests, what you'll want to start doing is you get four delivery quests per day where you get experience and money. And all together in a game, there's about 19 different weapons, 10 armors, and 38 items, and about a and there's a handful of cities or other points of interest to discover. Quite quite a bit of hidden stuff you can find as well. So yeah, as far as towns go, you have your standard stone keep town that's about as basic as it gets. That's where you have all your... There's a few shops you can buy very limited stuff. Green Tree is where you have the training center. It's one of the more important towns just for the training center. It's also a good place to get delivery quests. And it's also where you'll need to complete a lot of the tasks necessary to 
clear Turgon's name. So if you're from, coming from Legend of the Red Dragon 1, you're probably used to having to have a set amount of experience. You go fight the master, and if you win, you can go to the next level. It's a bit different here. Barak decided to change things, and now you drink a strange brew and some fantasy monster that's potentially imaginary appears, and you have to defeat it. And he seemed to vary quite a bit. But yeah, it's essentially the same mechanics. The fights are... the It's the same general fight mechanics as the original game. You run into something, you have the option of attack or run. So... As as you're traveling, we'll go over some of the people you might run into as you travel. You have the bounty hunters. You can put bounties out on other players. If the bounty hunters find you, where you'll have the option of either fighting or paying off the bounty. If there's no bounty out on you, you'll just see a message that they're close by and they'll leave you alone. There's traveling folk. If you talk to them, they'll fully heal you. Here's the Dragon Tooth Clan. They'll warn you about the Red Dragon. You can either listen to them or insult them. And if your alignment is negative 10 or less, you can actually be recruited. You have hooded figures, which are the people that will try to sell you parts of the Sky Staff. And there's a dark robed priest. They'll sell you a traveling potion. They'll take you to 10. There's 10 different potential places in the game it can take you. Be wary of actually using this if you're under level 10, because who knows where it'll take you. You might end up someplace you don't want to be. Oh yeah, and there's another quest early on. When you go see Hector in the room with Hector in that cave, check the two chests because you'll get an ancient flute that you can get repaired later on. And you can use that flute to have a spawn point. Well, not a spawn point, but a, it, it's basically a place where you can recall a recall point. So yeah, as far as the town goes, you have the green tree, you have stone keep. You have bone town, which is your town of of thieves and other roughnecks, hooligans, uh, sketchy people. You have casinos, the uh, there's prostitutes. It, it's your Las Vegas taken to an extreme. There's Flag City, Sosan Village, and Arisville as well. And there's some other places around the game. Most of them you're going to have you're going to have different shops. There'll usually be at least one unique place where you can talk to somebody there to get quests, whether it's a delivery one or some other quest. If you're trying to avoid adult content, then there is a quest you'll want to avoid early on in Green Tree that involves a pregnant girl. I'm not going into details, but if you're trying to avoid rather gross adult content, I would avoid it. There's also Castle Coldrick. If you have 20,000 gold, you can actually buy it. Assuming nobody else owns it. You can also buy Wizard's Keep, which is another place in the game you can buy.
So, yeah, that's that's pretty much about it with this game. It's as you can see by the graphics, it is very dated looking. It's not going. It, it, you could probably run this. You could play this on your phone browser pretty easily, probably. It wouldn't take much to play. The gameplay still holds up quite well, though. It's quite fun. If you can find a group of people to play with, and you have a bit of imagination, it's actually worth checking out. Oh yeah, there was one more thing I wanted to go over, which is the stats screen and what you want to keep track of. So, let me get those notes pulled up. So yeah, if you press V, your stats come up. You have your total experience, hit points, gold on hand, alignment, you can collect gems. You, there is a timer as far as how much time left you can play the game, or turns left depending on the server. You have the weapon and armor, which add to your attack and defense. Charm, which you gain through different activities. You have total attack as one figure and total defense as another figure. And yeah, your armor adds to attack. I mean, your armor adds to defense and your weapon adds to attack. It's pretty simple equations as well with a random number seed in there. So yeah, definitely check this game out. I, I was actually, I played this and Puzzle Pirates as the first two games for this series. I was expecting to drop out of both pretty quickly just out of boredom. Or frustration or just not being connected to it. I actually loved this game. If it wasn't for if it wasn't for a few issues with the game you have a lot of unused space on the map. And I just didn't feel as much connection to the, the Legend of the Red Dragon is you can play it for five you really only need five to ten minutes a day to play it. It puts everything into a short period of time, but that short period of time is quite a bit of fun. This game stretches it out quite a bit more, but not all of that time is enjoyable play time. You'll be wanting to get to another town, and because of bad luck, you'll end up running into creature after creature after creature, slowing down your trip. But yeah, for what it is, for as basic as it is, it is quite a bit of fun. I recommend it. It's not a war-heavy game. It's not a story-heavy game. It's not... It doesn't have uber-difficult game mechanics. There, there's really nothing this game does that stands out as overly impressive. But the entire package put together is an enjoyable game. And one... If for no other reason to check out to see what early multiplayer online role playing games were like or the graphical muds on BBSs. Hope you enjoyed the video. I do plan on getting a green screen pretty soon, a better camera, and having more professional videos as well as a new microphone. So, yep, hope you enjoyed. Have a great day.